everybody, thanks for tuning in to Border City Rock Talker. You get great news, great interviews, great interviewees with sometimes a comedic touch. Make sure you hit the like button, the notification bell, and subscribe to the channel. I hate to whine on subscribe to the channel like every time I watch a YouTube video, I get annoyed. But if you do that, I get bigger and bigger guests on my show for interviews. The more subscribers I have, so it's free. So please do that. Oh, and yeah! As per Poe, per Poe is it? <laughs> I'm going to edit that out. As per what I just said, I've got a big guest on. I've got Joel Hoekstra of not only White Snake fame, uh, Joel Hoekstra 13. Um, I believe you were a share. I mean, just it goes on and on. And we're here to talk about TSO. And how many years, Joel, have you been uh, running with the Trans-Siberian Orchestra uh, run? Since 2010. So, uh, yeah, I feel like I definitely solidly feel like a veteran at this point in time, even though, you know, I've technically started touring long before I was around. But I, I feel like I've, I've been here a bit. So that's like 13 years if the math here in Canada is right. So yeah. um, <laughs> the Canadian math system. Yes. Yes. Slightly different than the U S yes. Yeah. Well, we're, we count rocks, but <laughs> um, so with the 13 years you've been doing the run um, every year do, does um, I, we know Paul O'Neill was the uh, mastermind behind this, but every year is there something new that's added or, is it kind of um, one of those cookie cutter products where we don't want to change up anything? We want to keep it the same because it's you know it brings in people, um, you know, forty thousand arenas, seat arenas twice a day. Um, explain how it goes every year. Is there any surprises? Um, well, I, on the front, those that haven't seen Trans Siberian before, the front half is always a story or a rock opera, if you will, and that's. Um, those stories are either derived from the three Christmas albums, the trilogy, or in this case, um, a PBS special that was um, called The Ghosts of Christmas Eve. And that's um, essentially like a greatest hits or a best of. So those that haven't seen Trans-Siberian before, it's a good year to come check us out because you get to hear the music that put us on the map and made us who we are today, so to speak. So um yeah that's the this particular story is probably the lightest in terms of um content it tends to be very fan friendly and the second half of the show tends to focus more on the magnitude of the production itself um just kind of like you know those that haven't seen tso it's a visual spectacle i mean we have a video screen the width of the arena um, you know, it's snowing indoors, there are hydraulic lifts that the performers are out over the audience on, running through the audience playing. Um, you know, we got pyro like crazy, a Pink Floyd laser light show. I mean, it's it's incredible to look at. So because of that, you know, all that various content we're talking about and this music that's kind of a, a mix of the theatrical side telling the story in the front end and, and obviously kind of, you know, just your um, hard rock or metal kind of like, you know, Easter egged in a weird way for people, right? Like, because um, they're drawn in by the story and the production um, and obviously classical music. So it's it's a hybrid of a lot of elements. It's a, a very, very unique show and difficult to describe. Um, but you you kind of get something for all ages. And it's something right. that Paul O'Neill's vision was to make this affordable, um, despite the fact that we're one of the top Billboard and Polestar tours every year, um, to, to be like a family event, like something that, and, and we do see it and it's crazy, dude. Like, I mean, you can look out there and see like families three generations deep, the grandparents and the parents and the kids and everybody actually looks happy to be there. It's the, like the weirdest thing in the world. I mean, like, you know, that just doesn't happen on other tours. So right. this is set up, Paul O'Neill avoided the whole Ticketmaster, Gold Circle, Greedy, you know, whatever, five grand to sit in the front row kind of thing. And, you know, he wanted our diehard fans up front. That was something that he vehemently opposed. And, um, you know, so we have our fan club and our diehard fans are the ones up front. And, you know, his heart was in the right place in a lot of great areas, not just regarding that, but also a dollar from every ticket sold goes to local charities at every single show. So over the years now, having played to over, I believe it's 18 million people, you know, we've, wow. we've gotten over $18 million to local charities through doing this. And so it's, it's just a unique thing, dude. It's like, you know, it's, it's a rock show, but it's also got a lot of other elements to it. Um, and, you know, personally speaking for me, that hybrid of, 
of um, theater. That's something that I have some experience in through doing um, not only the rock theater shows that I did, like Rock of Ages, you might know about that I had yeah. done six over six years with that on Broadway, but also uh, an off Broadway show called Love Janice that was about Janice Joplin for a couple of years, and I actually actually did like traditional pit stuff too for a bit in on Broadway. So um, I have that element in me that kind of you know makes me a good fit for this and and i grew up in a classical world with my parents you know being classical musicians so um i kind of feel like you know i'm a i'm a good fit for this in regard that i've i have experience in those worlds because this it would be a hybrid of those three things you know it's it's a rock show but there's obviously elements of classical music mixed in and, and theatricality mixed in as well yeah you said a couple things that i can totally um agree with um Ticket prices are very, very reasonable, and I'm talking reasonable. I went to look at tickets because I'm going to go and see you um, either the 23rd at the Little Caesar Arena in Detroit or the 26th in Grand Rapids. I think I'm opting on that one, and the tickets are ridiculously. They're almost like Paul's vision was he wants everybody to see this so we're not gouging. So what you're saying is accurate. So for people that are thinking of going to the show and thinking that it's going to be a thousand dollar event for the family. Think again, go online. Um, where would they go online? Just the TSO website and then click on a link. Yeah. There. Yeah. Which is trans dash Siberian.com. Okay. I'll put a link um, below. Thank you. Yeah. That'd yeah. be helpful. Um, yeah. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I think Paul, you know, he was somebody who, he wasn't he wasn't greedy with this he he put it all back into the production i mean as as much money as the show generates with his uh, the sales that we do i mean we'll probably collectively with the west band and the east band play for a million people on this tour or slightly over um it's it obviously it it does generate money but the production generate or is you know he puts oh, wow. it in, into it i mean we've got usually on each side about 19 semis like carrying the set around and then nine right. buses carrying the performers around so it's a giant tour to get around um i'd say the difference between us and a lot of the giant pop tours is what we're talking about you know like yeah. the see the seats aren't five grand to go sit in the the upper deck or something like that i mean it's something that paul really um you know he wanted people to be able to enjoy he foresaw this being a tradition and i don't know if you ever met paul did you ever meet him um i haven't met him no unfortunately i mean paul was uh really eccentric you know, and um, a brilliant mind. But, uh, you know, I, I think if you would have been there when he drew up this idea or laid it out on paper and said, this is what I'm thinking about and, and we'll fill arenas twice a day and we'll be, you know, do, playing for over a million people a year, I think most people probably would have like rolled their eyes at it, to be honest, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And it's it's just cool to watch it come to fruition and be a, a small part of that. I mean, you know, one thing about this, Trans-Siberian is, you know, there's a there's a great pool of talent here. There's a lot of really talented people, but we all kind of set that aside. You know, you've got guys like Jeff Scott Soto in, involved here and, and Russell Allen and, you know, extremely talented people that do well in the rock world. Um, but we all just kind of take these two months and we set it aside for Trans-Siberian. You know, I mean, that that's what it's about. It's about the show here. Yeah. It's not, it's not about, you know, Joel Hoekstra or whatever, you know, it's, um, and, and it's cool to be a part of that. It's cool to, um, just be a part of the teamwork here and, um, so just, you know, see Paul's vision, like, you know, actually happen. He wanted this to live beyond him and, and, you know, Paul passed now and, uh, we're just, we're just trying to do him proud every year and go out and, and give people like the, the best show that we can. Right on. I got so many questions. Um, I was thinking um, he picks. Well, um, I don't know who's who's doing the um, the interviews these days for getting new cast members, but I'm sure that when he was doing it, just from his personality, he would look for a great musician or or you know somebody in that or you know a technician, <clears throat> but that's humble. And if you live in Quebec, it's called humble. <laughs> so, ah, okay. Um, I think that I think am I, is it fair to say that the all the people that you work with that you could characterize them as, as humble people? 
I mean, I think I think you have to have that element of selflessness um, in in this particular gig, mm -hmm. um, and you know that's that's been good for me. And I really have never had an issue with that. I've, I'm not traditionally like a quote unquote boss in any of my bands. You know, I mean, outside of Joel Hooker's Thirteen, which has essentially just been a recording, we did one gig, but um, you know, I'm I'm used to following orders i'm cool with it man you know and and this is you combine that with the workload on this the eight shows a week that we do do on each side while we're out so 16 shows a week are happening wow and people people sometimes wonder like well why the east and why the west band and it's like well how else are you going to cover the united states and even some canadian dates within reason doing a holiday show i mean what yeah. are you going to do start in like mid-august you know so i mean <laughs> So uh, it, it's, it makes sense for us to be able to cover it. And we do try to keep it, um, you know, similar. We try to keep that symmetry there between the East and West show. We put it together in the same arena. Like we have these rehearsals that we're in right now in an arena. And it's a very unique setup. It's really cool. We have um, a West stage setup that's on one side of the arena and an East on the other. And uh, it's kind of funny. It's arena. It, it's kind of funny because sometimes when we're we're playing on the east stage, they'll run the production elements on the west stage, and so we're like looking at what's behind us, like across the arena. It's a pretty neat experience, man. Wow! Uh, so it's cool, you know. The, our music directors do a great job. Al Petrelli uh, MDs the West Coast band, and he's you know a guitarist who's worked with everybody. You know, great, amazing musician who's covered. You know, he's been. And anywhere from Megadeth to Michael Bolton, you know what I mean? Like he's been able, like he's a really great player. And so I work with him on the guitar parts. We definitely make sure we're on the same page. And, um, you know, within reason, obviously everybody plays slightly different than one another. I have, you know, trouble playing some of the stuff that Al plays and, you know, and, but, uh, you know, I say, hey, well, this, this would fit more with like what I'll sound good doing. Is, is this cool with you? And, um, you know, so it, we, we work, we definitely work together to try and make it. So it's not like you're seeing two different shows, if that makes sense. We, yeah. we want to have like, yeah, like the, the respect to the show that if somebody's seeing it out West, they're seeing something similar to what they'd see out East. Right. Um, another thing that came to mind when you're talking about the first part was the story basically. And then the second part is kind of the, the visual phenomena. And you're talking about, um, um playing guitar um on a high rise over the fans it's snowing in the arena and when you're saying snowing in the arena it kind of made me think of the rocky horror picture show when i heard i never no i did see it once in toronto they played it every day for years and you'd go in and apparently the thing was you bring a paper bag you bring a squirt gun and all those things so when there's scenes of rain you squirt up and then it hits the paper bag yeah yeah, I mean, and I guess to answer your question earlier, when you asked about um, whether or not it's a cookie cutter thing, like if it's the same thing every year. So the story changes um, depending on the year on the front end. Um, I'd say that the goal is usually to, uh, so there's an element of tradition with this, right? Like mm -hmm. you want people to feel like this is their Christmas tradition. So you don't want to come back and hit them with something completely different, yet you don't want to give them the same show. Right, um, yeah. So Because you don't want people to feel like, you know, it's Groundhog Day with Bill Murray either, right? So, yeah. um, I mean, we try to give them a show that evolves and is slightly different, um, but also not change the level of familiarity to the point where it doesn't feel like a tradition. And yeah. that it really is for so many people. I mean, we have a, it's an incredible fan base, dude. It's like, I, oh, yeah. I've, I, I've called us the grateful dead of Christmas. You know, we've got like <laughs> just people that come every year and even go city to city to watch a show. You'll see people at various shows and, traditionally up until um covid hit you know we had the signing lines after every evening show so we met our fan base you know and sure. became friends with them and so it, it's unique in that regard like it's this huge tour but we also feel very grassroots because it's like oh hey you know we're on a first name basis with a lot of the the, the diehard fans mm -hmm. and you you know them and um it's it's just a really unique 
setup that I can't, I can't really compare it to anything, you know, like um, there's something cool about you're on this incredible stage with all the lasers and the pyro and all this stuff. And yet we're allowed to like step down into the audience on certain songs and go play to a kid, like a little kid, like sitting wow. there, which number one, you don't see at a normal rock show. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's it's incredible like you know then you hand them a pick and then 10 seconds later you're back up out there you know on the big stage and it there's something fun about that for me i don't know it's yeah. it's cool it, it's just fun you know i it's it's something that i think you know not it's going to sound like self-aggrandizing but like that that moment has affected a lot of people i've gotten a lot of emails from people like hey my that changed my kids year you know like that or made them want to play guitar or they wow. had been playing guitar and they, they weren't taking it seriously until they came to that show and you came down and handed them that pick and that changed everything. And um, so it does, it does a lot of good. And that, that really all, it all starts with Paul O'Neill with that, you know, that it was really, like you said, he was the mastermind behind all this. And I give him all the credit in the world to, for believing it. And he put his money where his mouth is. You know, I think that in the early going, this was maybe not, well, <laughs> not maybe not. It was not profitable like it is these days, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think I think Paul believed in it and had a vision. It's kind of it's kind of old school. It's kind of like when labels would get behind a band. And even if a band, you know, had their first couple of records, didn't quite do it. They, if they believed in a band, they stuck with them until, you know, all of a sudden, boom they have this huge career that lasts a lifetime. And so, um, you know, Paul was very much like that with this. He, he believed in it a lot and he believed in us a lot too, you know, um, I sound corny, but you know, Paul was like always the biggest proponent of all of us. I mean, he was like, he championed all of us and we'd always, you know, say every time he'd see you, he'd tell you all your good qualities. And it, 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 it kind of made you feel like, well, I can't, I can't let this guy down. <laughs> you know, like he, I mean, he believed, that, was, that was his hook, but no, he, I mean, hey, if, if, if that was his trick, it worked, you know, because it, I mean, it did make you feel that way. He was a great, he was a great guy and it made you feel like, I don't want to let this guy down. I'm going to give this guy every, everything I have, you know, the, the, the workload thing that, you know, the eight shows a week and um, it's not for the faint of heart. Like you have to actually enjoy working and you have to enjoy like doing what you do because it's when you're doing two shows that are just a little like over two hours, let's say they're like about two hours and 10 minutes, two hours, 15 minutes, something like that. By the time you've sound checked, played a show that was high pressure, get done, take a short break, play another show. And then we used to have the signing lines afterwards and you're getting on the bus at midnight and you're like, man, we got into the arena today at like, you know, 11 a.m. When you do that Friday, Saturday, Sunday in a row and it's three different cities, it's it's inc it's incredibly challenging compared to like a standard rock tour. You know, um, when I would go out with other bands and go play three, four shows a week, 75 minute sets or something like that, it, it felt very vacation like to be honest like like hey yeah, you can go back to white snake or no vulture <laughs> 13 and you'd be like i mean they'd be like holy you look so relaxed <laughs> i'm not yeah a six hours set today exactly so i mean it, you gotta you gotta be willing to work and and um you know that that for me has never really been a problem i i kind of i have always looked at that like well what better way to uh, or what a great opportunity that is to be able to get out on an arena stage and play for 10,000 people for over four hours a day. Yeah. You know, like that's not something that comes along every day. I try to look at it that way. And that's, that's what you want. You want something that makes you feel comfortable with that and feel familiar with that. And it improves you as a player too, you know, like, Hey, how, how many hours did you play guitar today? Oh, I, I played over four hours just playing our two shows and i and that if you include warming up it's probably five or six hours so um you know just the things that keep the guitar in my hands that's always something i look for even outside of tso just ways to um, make a living playing music but like ways to keep the guitar in my hands because i want to get better too does that make sense right. oh yeah 100 yeah. percent, joel um i've got a question um it's it's not controversial. It's an it, it's an honest question. I'm I'm a Catholic. I'm Christian. Whatever, and I love all religions. I mean, people are people, right? We're all human beings. Now, the the show is 
primarily based on Christianity. Am I right? No, I'd say okay, it's, okay, actually, okay. it's 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 more. I mean, there are there's there's quotes of a lot of very famous Chris, uh, Christmas carols. Oh, okay. Um, um, so, but I would say it's more based on the story, and mm-hmm. um, so I think everybody's welcome. You know, that's, that's uh, what I, I mean. Was- I, 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 everybody's welcome. And I mean, in fact, the name itself, which is, of course, much maligned these days with the, the phrase trans meaning more, you know, carrying oh, heavy, never thought heavier, of that. heavier weight, heavier weight than it used to. Paul's vision really was um, naming this band after the Trans-Siberian Railway because it right. brought the most cultures together. It brought yeah. it was something that brought people together. Mm-hmm. And that was really his vision with this. So I, I, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily like a, you know, um, a Christian show per se. I'd say it's something that um, you, you obviously you're going to hear carols like quoted and 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 such in the shows that mm-hmm. are probably derived from that culture. But um, in general, man, it's just about bringing people together. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't trying to get controversy. I was just kind of morphing it into my um, question of. Um, do you see a lot of different um, cultures coming in and enjoying the show, um, whether they're this religion or that religion? Because like I said, we're all human beings. And if they have a show like the, um, the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, and it's been talked about so much, and it was, say, Muslim or um, Orthodox Jewish, I would go to see the show from the reviews. I mean, I would put you know, religion aside, just for the production and the, and the love aspect coming out of the the entertaining and, and that sort of thing. Do you see um, a lot of different cultures coming in or is it something you don't notice or? You know? um, yeah, I, I'd say that, yeah, there there's a lot of uh, this show appeals to the widest range of people that I've Super. ever witnessed. You know, I mean, that being said, you know, I'm usually part of like an 80s rock band. So like that's a very specific um draw. It's usually like people in my age bracket that grew up with the music. So you're like and, you're 39, you know. right? I saw on Facebook. 39, I wish, dude. But um I mean, I'll take it sure. Let's say it. Let's spread that rumor. Okay. Um yeah, that sounds good to me, but yeah, I wish, dude. Um uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I do. I, th- I think the show brings people together. There's really um, the, 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 the most cliche. I, ha- I say it in interviews and it's like it sounds beyond cliche, but like there's something in this show for everyone. Like, I honestly, I think that kids that come, they're probably not listening to the story on the front end, you know? No. Like they're they're like looking at like the lasers and the video screen and just going like wow this is cool to look at and um and for the guitar it probably ends there you know and I I think there's a lot of people like you and I that are there because they're like hey this this they're they're putting on a rock show here like people you know there there might be the story on the front end and and putting people in the holiday spirit but it's it's kind of like introducing people to our style of music you know um in an interesting way um so uh, i i would go because it's a cool rock show speaking for myself you know i mean that's what i would if if i were like i'm not in the band i would be going because it's a cool rock show yeah there's um the night i think it's called the night conceives yeah night conceived yeah yeah i saw gabby doing that one and i mean for anybody that's not even into hard rock or heavy metal or hard rock let's say um just check out um on youtube and then we know you're going to go get your tickets now speaking of female singers um i've interviewed gabby and um i think katie share i think she was a backup singer i could be wrong but you have a canadian in there and she's basically um a lot of these bands from the late 70s early 80s you know members fall in members fall out people pass unfortunately but I believe Rosa. Um, I, what's her Lear shoot? Lear shooting? Lear shooter? Yeah, remember. you know what? You're probably doing it better than I'm gonna. So we'll yeah, roll. I, I, yeah. Um, have you met her? And um, or have oh you yeah, it, it, yeah. Both both bands. We see each other throughout this rehearsal period here for like a little over two weeks. 
So, yeah, we see each other at rehearsals for a couple weeks, and then we go our separate ways on the tour. She's with the West Tour, and I'm with the East. But um, Rosa's great. I uh, I definitely dig her singing a lot. And I actually um, recommended her to our – I think your friends are Jim Peterick, too. Yeah. Or I've interviewed Jim. Jim was making a Women Who Rock album for Frontiers, and and, – I recommended a few people to him and Rosa was one of them for him to look into. And I, and he used her on that one of the tracks, I believe on that record. So um, yeah, she's, she's great, man. You know, she's really cool and uh, sings her ass off. Well, I mean, if you've seen any of the stuff she's done with the head pins, Holy geez. Um, I love Darby Mills, the original singer, but I mean, Rosa's got her own style and her own voice, but I mean, identically, I can't even tell the difference. She sings so great. But um, so everybody, if you're in the West Coast, uh, make sure you check out the show, especially if you're an expat, you're living in the States from Canada. Now, let's talk about, oh, one more thing with the TSO, uh, Joel. Um, Has TSO thought about bringing their show in any form to maybe England? Well, it's a North they, American production. they've done, they've done, uh, some European stuff. Oh. Um, you know, the, the, the thing with trans Siberian is, um, it's essentially like derived from the band sabotage. Like that's the core of the band. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as it found success, when the dates needed to cover the entire U.S. around the holiday period, they kind of took sabotage and split it down the middle and said, okay, you guys go this way, you guys go this way, and then we fill out the band with guys like me, you know, who just come in and like, hey, this guy, you know, plays with rock bands and be a good fit for what we're doing here. Um, so I I didn't get to do the European run. There was one that was post uh holiday tour that they did in Europe and I you know I don't know exactly how that did um so there's always talk um about this expanding and having additional touring companies etc like another branch of the tour so to speak Mm -hmm. where that would be I couldn't tell you but um you know that's that's out of my pay grade (laughs) I mean yeah that would be something they'd have to do for management, you know, I mean, it's, it's something that's beyond, I, I, I stay in my lane here and like learn the, the music and um, try to, it's challenging enough, trust me, because, you know, they take, they take a look at a lot of stuff and a lot of the material is actually really difficult to play. So you got to spend a lot of time, you know, right. getting, just get, getting it together, making sure you can do the, do your job the best, but yeah, I mean, uh, it would be cool to see it expand, you know? I'd love to see that sphere used in Vegas for it. I think it would be amazing. I heard you know? about the sphere. Um, Paul Shortino told me about that. Um, is it open now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. I, I think, you know, our our lighting designer, Brian Hartley, is amazing. And he probably would do something incredible with that. So that would be really kind of fun to see what he would do with that. Maybe there could be something with that. That would be fun. So if the viewers, uh, I, if the viewers are aware, basically the sphere, from what I understand, Joel, correct me if I'm wrong, if you're flying into Vegas sort of thing um, and it's at night, let's say they're having a basketball game, I guess the outside of the sphere is going to be um, pixelated to show a basketball game. Is that something like that? And if it's a different event, that's the sort of thing. If you're If you're flying over, it'll be pixelated to be a concert, rock concert, something like that. I just think it's it's like immersive, like everything that's happening is all around you when you're inside okay. it. So I think, you know, it'd, be, it'd just be fun because uh, obviously we're heavy on the production elements with TSO. I mean, it's been a big part of uh, TSO's success, in my opinion, is the production of it itself. So I just think it'd be a lot of fun. Is there a DVD I, or anything? Uh, that's something I don't want to forget to ask. What's up? Is there a DVD out there that people can get the TSO show? video one no i mean i there was a live stream um in 2020 during covid but i believe that was just kind of like a one-off run thing it ran and and that was that i th- i don't believe there is a live dvd of the show no well kenny if you're listening <laughs> maybe a dvd would be great and um you know all the sales can go towards a certain charity anyways let's talk about white snake <laughs> There's this okay thing. sure um, yeah so, obviously, anybody that knows hard rock and knows Joe Hoekstra and knows White Snake, 
knows that um, it's kind of up in the air. Um, right now, actually, I just found out Tanya O'Halligan. Is that how you pronounce her last name? I keep screwing that up. She's actually um, touring with Bruce Dickinson um, in South America coming up. Yeah, Tanya's been playing with Bruce pretty much since we got, um, you know, in our holding pattern with Whitesnake. So, um, you know, she's doing great. Tanya is a, a great player. And uh, in addition to looking really cool, I mean, you know, Tanya obviously looks great, but she's she's a she's a killer bass player, man. You know, she yeah. came in on the gig and it was like, wow, like we sound really good with her. And uh, that's something even Tommy Aldridge, you know, Tommy Aldridge was like, wow. You know, he was he was really impressed with her when um, she came in and, and started playing. And um, so she's just, you know, she she was a, a really cool bandmate in what we did of our farewell tour. Um, you know, in regards to that resuming, I know literally as much as you do, man. I mean, David's in constant contact with us on the band thread, but it's more of like what happens on his Twitter account. It's like memes and humor and just kind of fun stuff. And we all know enough not to prod him on stuff. And, and uh, you know, David, is, I have a great friendship with him and um, he's a great guy and a great boss. Um, I, I was lucky enough to go out and spend some time with him this year, you know, nothing, you know, not like new music or anything like that, that needs to be like, you know, clickbait for anybody or anything like that. But, um, spent some time with him and probably going to go back out in early 2024. So, um, whatever David wants to do is cool with me. Obviously everybody in the band would love it if we get out and, and play again, um, but that being said, David, he's, he's a legend, man. He's earned the right to do whatever he wants to do. Yeah. I've been around in the grand scheme of things. I've been around a very short amount of time in white snake, um, since 2014. So, you know, nine, nine years or so. So he's earned the right to do whatever he wants to do. If he wants to, um, call it quits with playing live, he's got my full support with that, but obviously we'd all love it if we could play. Um, he's quite you know, a He's quite a jokester, in my opinion, because he likes to he likes to get everybody's attention and little here and there. Because I think recently he must have tweeted or something about the fact that if he were to re um, start touring, he might ensemble some former members. And I think Adrian Vandenberg had commented on that. Did you hear about something like that? Yeah, I think that was in the context of maybe a final recording, oh, okay. um, which recording. which which. which which is, I literally know the same amount that you guys do. Like, I see that in an interview, and I see it online, and that's, you know, the extent of it. Um, he hasn't really talked to me um, about that, but I, you know, believe that that would, incur, that would include everybody from the current lineup and hopefully, you know, uh, include past members. I think that would be great. I would, that would be an amazing, uh, way for, for white snake. If that's David's vision, that sounds cool to me. I'd love to be on a recording with all these great players that have been a part of the band. And, um, yeah. that, work, that totally works. I mean, it's always been that way, man. When you join a band like this, where, you know, some of the guitar players include, you know, these legendary players and, and, you know, I'm, I'm just honored to be a part of the, the, the legacy of it a little tiny bit of it you know it, that works for me um yeah yeah for sure so um i think that'd be amazing and you know adrian and uh i got to talk with him briefly on the monsters of rock cruise this past year which is something i'll be doing again this year and and uh he's a great guy and i think adrian is um really a a, a great well-rounded musician who's a really great um songwriter and a really great parts player writes always comes up with the perfect part for a song um really He's great guitar player. Too. yeah yeah and, and a really nice guy so I you mean, know i i mean and and the same goes for for david um you know coming in i didn't really know what to expect with david you know i mean i i met him and just the one time and was offered the job and uh but you know, I'm nine years in and I haven't had a, a single bad moment with David. It's just been great, you know, and uh, I do have nothing but gratitude for everything he's done in my time in the band for me. And he's done exactly what he said he would do, you know, upon me joining the band. And um, so uh, he's been nothing but great to me, man, um, just from a personal standpoint. So I, you know, 
uh, I got nothing but but love for David. He's he's a great guy, great great boss, great friend, and uh, so like you know, dude, it, it's just about respecting. I think at the end of the day, that he yeah. has the right to do whatever he wants. You know, well, absolutely. I mean, the haters out there, like screw them. I mean, and you know what I think? I personally am hoping, with fingers crossed. I was talking to Don Dawkins recently about his vocals, and the same thing. He, I think he mentioned was Tom Kiefer couldn't sing for three years he had he had a throat surgery or I, I think it was tom but it's been how many months since um since the tour stopped roughly about six months five months no longer than that we oh, stopped yeah. in when did that i'm trying to think exactly when now uh maybe like something like may or june of 2022 something like that because we we did the UK and we were about halfway through Europe um, mm-hmm. when, you know, uh, David got this, you know, really bad sinus infection that I th- I believe turned out to be two separate things at the, right. kind of simultaneously. And that just kind of shut us down. But, you know, we're just, you know, we're still in contact. And I, I think everybody's on the same page, man. We all love David yeah. and like whatever, whatever he wants to do works for us. Well, I think, but, the, I think all, of, all of us obviously want to play. I mean, come on, let's be realistic, right? I mean, that's every every musician wants to go out and tour. So, well, I think the great thing is is that there's a you know, I mean, my fingers are crossed that with this extra healing time, because you know, vocals are are, are a muscle like anything else, and when you overuse it, just like your tendons and your fingers and that sort of thing, um, maybe seven eight months of um, you know, not singing might strengthen him, and maybe he'll come back. But like you said, it's up to David Coverdale. He's the legend that brought us all these great shows, albums, music, and he's brought all these great musicians together. So, um, you know, let's just hope for the best and whatever David wants, he wants. Now, let's talk about Joel Hoekstra 13. Um, you, did you, you said you just released an album this year. Um, is there any plans on recording any more? Yeah, I'll probably, a matter of fact, while I'm out with Trans-Siberian here on the days off um, and on single show days when I have time to just kind of sit with my guitar, I'll probably start working on uh, the ideas for that next album and probably set the wheels in motion. So that's that's usually Vinnie Apice on drums on the three records that I've done and uh so get I usually get the ideas together and get those to Vinny and then Vinny plays and then Tony Franklin has done the bass on all three and Derek Sharanian has done the keys and um I'm lucky enough to be good friends with Jeff Scott Soto. So he's always done the, the backing vocals on the album, which really makes it like amazing. You know, he yeah. really ups ups the game. Um in terms of, you know, when you take a guy like that and who's, you know. Uh, a legendary rock singer himself and, mm-hmm. and he's like yeah i'll sing backups on it for you sure you know um so la- the, this latest record had this uh you know kind of indian uh, f- phenomenon like uh girish pradhan he's a, a young phenom like up and coming sang lead on it and he, he sounds amazing and so i'll probably work with girish again um schedule permitting for him and um but yeah, that that's like my opportunity. Those records to uh, be the guy who writes the the lyrics and the vocal melodies and gets to kind of have the final say so in what the mix sounds like and what the artwork looks like, et cetera. And just kind of, I guess, you know, to summarize, be the boss for a minute. You know, like just have an opportunity where it's um, my baby. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so where are you calling in from? Are you calling in from home uh, in New York or are you at the arena? Are you uh, rehearsing? I'm in the hotel. So, yeah, we we, we rehearse uh, in the Omaha area. We're okay. Actually, the the arena itself is just kind of over the border um, into Council Bluffs, Iowa. So, which is just like, it, it sounds like we're traveling far to the arena, but it's not. It's literally like a seven minute drive or something like that. Okay, so that arena must be huge in Omaha. If you're having one set, East Coast, one on the West Coast on each side of the arena, is it must be a big arena. It's a standard size arena, but it just you know, I just a unique setup. It's cool. 
I, I sometimes wonder, I'm like, well, where else would I see this? You know, like where you see two full setups in one arena kind of facing each other. So um, it's uh, it's definitely interesting. And we we each, you know, the the West Band will come out and watch us on the main stage from time to time and hear what we're doing. And there's usually a night before we leave here for the tour where we come watch the West Band and what they're doing. And um, I always try and make that. Like I said, you know, part of my job here is to make sure that things are symmetrical and, um, you know, they're not doing anything drastically different than us. Yeah, you're kind of like, uh, you, well, you're a veteran in the band now, so. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a, a veteran in the band and that's, you know, our music director is a keyboard player um, who's, you know, a ridiculous talent, Derek Wheland. He's incredible, you know, but uh, it's, you know, their, their music director being a guitarist, sometimes I can become kind of that point person on if they're doing something different on guitar than we are, um, then I can kind of, at least keep an eye on that and make sure that we're not drifting too far apart in terms of what we're doing. Yeah. You got to have your kind of uniqueness, but at the same time, it's, it's going to come down to uh, recognizable for, for the fans that are coming back. Right. Absolutely. hundred percent. Perfect. Okay. I'll let you go, Joel. I know you've got uh, some more uh, press tomorrow. Um, you might recognize this question. What's the opposite of unsubscribe? Subscribe. <laughs> Everybody do as great guitarist Joel Hoekstra says and subscribe to the channel for these great interviews. Check the links below. I'll have all the links to Joel's website as well as the TSO website as well as the White Snake website. And uh, once again, thanks for taking the time out for the viewers today, Joel. Hey, great to talk with you again, buddy. I hope you have a good one. Congrats on everything moving upwards on your channel. I hope things continue to go well for you. And uh, hopefully we'll speak again down the road, bud. I'll see you on the 26th or the 23rd in... Uh... The Detroit, Michigan, or the Grand Rapids area for sure, man. Sounds great, man. I'll see you there. Take care. Okay, bye-bye.